Some films were harmed in the making of this podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of For Your Consideration, the podcast featuring roundtable discussions reevaluating the cinematic canon of past masterpieces and modern classics. I'm Mike Josick. And I'm Dustin Friesenhenge. Thanks for joining us. This week we'll be doing something a little different. Dustin and I were talking about what we wanted to do for a Halloween episode, and over the course of that discussion, we decided that instead of doing a single movie or doing a batch of smaller movies, for the month of October, instead of just kind of cramming our favorite Halloween movies into one episode, we would take the entire month of October to celebrate a number of horror movies. Ones that have spawned whole series, franchises, that have been going on for 20 odd years. And that, coincidentally, we're all remade. And we're going to sort of compare, contrast what is ostensibly a classic with what a lot of people will probably give a lot of crap for being a remake and for being a slasher. So we'll be doing four original films and their remake. And for the last weekend in October, which also happens to be, I think, October 30th, Dustin and I are going to talk about a number of horror films that we think are worth checking out. That are currently on Netflix, just in case you happen to decide to do so yourself. So on to the film. (laughs) (laughs) So for this first week, we're going to be talking about the 1980 horror cult classic. And it's 2009 remake. Friday the 13th. A.K.A. that film which isn't actually about the killer you think it is, but the remake is very sure to change that as quickly as possible. So the 1980 version was released on May 9th of that year. It was written by Victor Miller and directed by Sean S. Cunningham and Dustin What were your thoughts when you revisited this film? When I initially saw this film, I was living back at my mom's place. The movie store had a seven movies, seven days, seven dollars deal going on. (laughs) So I basically decided I'm going to watch all these classic horror movie franchises that I had never seen before in my life. And Friday the 13th was obviously one of them. And I remember enjoying them progressively more and more, sort of as the series goes on, until the latest one at the time for this series was Jason X, where we're nice and in space, which was worse than the first, which essentially made the first one second worst. And it kind of lived up to that, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) The movie itself is not that good and it's actually kind of hard to see how it was supposedly so scary to anyone who is there i'm guessing the times have changed a whole lot since then we expect more or we've become so desensitized and jaded perhaps that we need much more violence and more graphic tits i suppose there's a lot of weird stuff that doesn't make sense in the movie you look at uh you look at like the strip monopoly scene which is your tna that they got which doesn't even go to fruition until somebody just They just stop the whole thing when a door slams open for no good reason. You've got a bunch of classic tropes, because these are the movies that made them, of course. You've got the fake death of the guy not quite drowning in the ocean, or the, the lake, sorry. You've got the crazy hermit who's insisting on warning everybody in the creepiest possible way, aka hiding out their pantry for four hours until someone opens it. Just it's There's a lot of ridiculous, weird stuff that goes on and not-so-good pacing. It's it's kind of bland for the first half. Not much is even happening, and then everything happens all at once. And I knew who the I knew who the killer was, and I was expecting some sort of hints or clues towards who it might be. I was expecting Pamela Voorhees to be introduced earlier on, even just as a side character. But no, it's not until the last two minutes that she suddenly appears out of nowhere in in a car despite the fact that she just threw a body through a window unless she set up some sort of weird rig to do that for her a lot of the timing just makes no sense she's out in the woods is she in the house is she in the cabin is she out driving and killing the other guy the guy who's in charge of the camp you just you don't know (laughs) it makes no sense she's teleporting it's it's a it's actually what they're going to do in the video game that they're going to make that jason can teleport and that must be what pamela could do and jason inherited that you it's mentioned a genetic trait. <laughs> you mentioned that you think that maybe it was scary because in 1980 this was just kind of considered very intense, but I'm not so sure that's the case because as I was watching this movie, I was thinking that I I'm pretty sure it was an R rating. I did a quick kind of check on the internet while you were just talking there and I couldn't find out exactly what the rating was, but pretty sure it was an R. There's 
almost no nudity. There's very little blood and gore. And there's like, even an off screen death. <laughs> there's an off screen death. And, and honestly, like, I think Jaws has more suspense and gore than this movie does. So I'm actually shocked on many levels why this movie was as popular as it was and why it did as well as it did because it's severely marginal. It has huge gaps in it, minutes-long sequences where nothing is happening. And from everything that I've heard, people in the theater were like on the edge of their seats and screaming and don't go there and don't open that. And I just don't see where that suspense was building. And so much of the movie just felt cobbled together. And I suppose in a certain sense, I was watching a making of and the writer, Victor Miller, was talking about when they decided to make a horror movie, Halloween was basically killing at the box office, and they were like, okay, well, we need to make a movie like Halloween if we want a successful movie. So he went and he watched Halloween by John Carpenter, and he made some notes about what made this movie kind of tick, and he went home and he wrote his own movie. And if you watch Friday the 13th, there are so many bits in it that seem to be echoes of Carpenter's Halloween, but I think what Miller's script was lacking and what Cunningham's direction was lacking uh, compared to uh, John Carpenter and Deborah Hill's work on Halloween, it just didn't have the soul. It was like... It was very bland and tasteless. (laughs) Even beyond that, like, we were talking kind of off air. Halloween has its own internal logic. I may change my mind if I revisit that film in the near future. It's been a few years since I've seen it, but there seemed to be... Michael Myers was never anywhere doing anything that was completely irrational or inexplicable. He was just crazy serial killer guy coming in and... or spree killer. He wasn't a serial killer. He was a spree killer. Well, he did kill a family as a kid. Now he's coming back to killing other people. That's multiple sprees. (laughs) That's... (laughs) Multiple sprees. If there's a similar motive. (laughs) But Mrs. Voorhees, she was, like you said, about the window and the Jeep. And, of course, there's the the famous kill with Kevin Bacon and the arrow through the throat. Where she was apparently hiding under a bed while they're having sex. And was she hiding (laughs) under that bed all day? Because earlier that day is when she killed the guy that's sitting on the top bunk. But then wasn't she creeping around in the bathrooms in the showers when the girls were in there? And didn't she also kill the the lead guy in the camp who was driving around prior to that? So did she come back and go under the bed hoping that maybe they don't see the body? Like, it's... And that scene is, I mean, it's it's the big famous kind of kill from that movie, uh, with the exception of maybe Mrs. Voorhees getting beheaded at the end with a machete by... Um, God, I can't even remember the names of the characters in this movie. <laughs> I remember the names of the actors. I think that's that's... The most memorable character for me was the girl who was going there because she was she wanted to work with inner city kids. She had all these hopes and dreams about it, and she was hitchhiking in, and she dies before even making it to the camp, and that was the only character who was a character to me. <laughs> that was kind of interesting to me because she did die so soon, because it kind of has, you know, the Drew Barrymore at the beginning of Scream. You expect that to be the survivor. <laughs> that, that's kind of a bit of an echo, yeah. Like, you introduce that character... You assume that that character is going to, you know, at least last more than 10, 15 minutes into the movie. So I kind of respected them doing that, but I think its execution was really poor because it just sort of happens. And it's so staged and it's it's so telegraphed. I mean, you see it coming well before it actually happens. And it's so awkward that she's in this car with this person who never says a word to her. It's overacted. And then there's the chase in the woods. And I mean, I know that they're just trying to get a kill in there for suspense and action and thrills. Let you know that there's a killer. (laughs) But it just... Also for the fake mislead because she's driving the same Jeep the the owner drives, which makes no sense because the second you learn that he's driving the same Jeep, he's basically killed like three minutes after. So that makes no sense. (laughs) And I wish they would have actually played on her absence. No one, I think someone might have mentioned at one point that she was a good cook and they were looking forward to seeing her. At the beginning, he was saying, yeah, when she gets here, get her immediately on this. She's supposed to be the cook and whatnot. Although later on, when he's at his 10-hour lunch, he's uh, talking about how there's only the six people. (laughs) His 10-hour lunch. 
He's that talking. was so fabulous when they cut to him at that freaking diner. And how long has he been there? It's nighttime. He left like in the afternoon. I don't even remember why he left. I remember he, he left saying when What's Her Face gets here, set her up in the kitchen. She's our new cook. And when he's at the diner, he's talking about how there's six people at the camp, obviously not including the seventh person who's apparently disappeared. Nobody really mentions her after that point. You see people actually cooking and nobody's like, man, where the heck is she? I mean... She should have been here by now. Yeah, nobody mentions it. They're just like, eh, whatever, my job now. (laughs) Because the whole movie is just a bunch of little set pieces that were strung together, and then other just dead scenes to fill its 95-minute running time, because... It's very Shyamalan. People are just there doing what they need to do to advance the plot. (laughs) In particular, at the very end, when she's like, well, now that everyone's dead... I'm getting out in this boat. <laughs> I feel I feel like I the feel middle compelled of the night. to go into the lake in a canoe. Isn't that what you do after you survive something? You go out canoeing? You after, you, after you chop off somebody's head with a machete? Well, she'd have to pass past the body in order to get away from the boat, maybe. And she's like, well, I'm going to... I don't want to look at the body. I don't want to even pretend this camp is even here. I'm just going to go out in the boat for a bit, take a nap, wake up in the morning. Hopefully they don't insinuate that Jason's alive, which would make no no goddamn sense. It's been 10 years and he's still a kid, first off. And so what was he doing for the last 10 years? That he decides to come out right then and there. That makes no sense. But that was a dream. Or was it? Dun, dun, dun. That and was a they, dream and they never really... They never intended this film to, to have 10 sequels and a remake. So, and I think I remember hearing or reading somewhere... Uh, when they were making two and they were deciding, let's make Jason the villain, like this was not something that had ever been considered by Victor Miller or Sean Cunningham, which is kind of a funny little twist to the whole franchise that the film that started it all is the one that's least connected. (laughs) Now, to be fair, I've been pretty hard on the movie, but since the, the first time I saw it way back when to watching it just the other night, I still champion the idea of Mrs. Voorhees being the villain. I do think that was a really good move. I thought it was very creative and unexpected. She had a good motive. She was properly crazy here in the voices. Like, I, I did like her as a villain. Having a female villain. Talking about women doing things that are normally reserved for men. Hell, even in the movie earlier on, who's fixing the gutter? Not one of the guys. No, it's one of the girls. It's something that you don't normally see. Normally, they're nicely relegated to roles. And I think that might also be part of the reason why this movie is remembered as fondly as it is. Although the film does have its detractors uh, after watching it. I did kind of go prowling on the internet looking for what other people thought of it. There are some very low ratings for this movie. Understandable. (laughs) But it is, and I thought it was interesting that it was referred to as a cult classic uh, when people talk about Nightmare on Elm Street or Halloween or Poltergeist or, you know, you think of any big film that created a franchise. They're very rarely considered cult classics. To be a cult classic, you have to grow in popularity later on or have like your small subset this was popular when it came out it's not phantasm that one i'd call a cult classic but i think it's a cult classic because it was it's still a very independent movie and it's an odd little movie and i think people recognize that it's not a great movie but it spawned 10 sequels and a remake which is pretty amazing when you think about it i've seen puppet master <laughs> Just because there's a lot of movies doesn't mean that anything impressive happened. <laughs> no, but there is a there is a small, like, hardcore base of Friday the 13th fans who really love this movie. And they keep coming back year after year. Every single sequel and the remake have all made money. Everyone. And that's domestically. That's not even international. But yeah, I do think that despite the copycat nature of so many things in this movie... From the point of view killer to the pacing. I mean, Halloween in and of itself, I think, is kind of a long, drawn-out film as well. And when I found out that Friday the 13th was kind of based on the structure of Halloween and and the way Halloween executed its uh, plot points and murders and thrills and chills, I just got fucking lost. (laughs) I think I'm trying to say that having, having heard that, Watching the film, I could just 
totally see how they were echoes of Michael Myers and... Absolutely. Which brings us to the next one, the remake. Which came out in 2009, but I'm going to find... If it wasn't released on Friday the 13th, I'll be sorely disappointed. You have 10, 10 movies, 29 years to plan that shit out. <laughs> <laughs> Let's release it on February 3rd. It'll be a Thursday. Normally, movies are released on Friday anyway. Come on. The remake was released on February 13th, 2009, which I can only assume was a Friday. And it was directed by Marcus Nispel. And uh, screenplay was by Damien Shannon and Mark Swift, who I believe were also responsible for the Freddy vs. Jason that came uh, previous to it. And uh, as people may or may not know, this is one of yet another Michael Bay-produced horror remakes. And everything he touches is made of profit, so another success, I would suppose. Only unlike a lot of Michael Bay movies, I enjoyed this one a little bit more, I guess? Maybe because I didn't expect anything from it. I had really mixed feelings about this one because after watching the original, I was really looking forward to really to seeing something that had some production value to it. And I think this movie had that. But despite the production value, I felt like even more so than the first, all the characters, all the situations were all very contrived. And it it didn't feel like they existed in any kind of real world it it felt like this was some bizarre like alternate snow globe reality where where nobody can ever find this kid who's apparently been living in this shack two feet from the entrance of camp crystal lake as it looks like every single time they go there (laughs) except for the one there's the one scene where they're like let's not go to the camp let's go this way and they find the cabin immediately then there's the other scene where someone's running away from the cabin and he runs out of the entrance of Camp Crystal Lake. Where is this cabin? It's apparently right there, but maybe it's floating around in some sort of ethereal realm, only to show itself when a death needs to happen. Jason controls the gate. It's one of his superpowers. Fan theory. Discuss. (laughs) I do think this movie was easier to watch. I don't know if it's necessarily a better movie, although I do think it has more story than the original does. I also kind of respect... The fact that they're sort of trying to cram a lot of history and canon into this remake uh, references while also making Jason the primary villain, even though Mrs. Voorhees was the primary villain in the first film. And they accomplish this by the opening title sequence is a black and white flashback where you get to see the death scene, essentially, of Pamela and just the death scene. Why so do you she... keep saying Pamela? Pamela Voorhees. Is that actually her name? That's her name. Okay. I only know because I saw it written like four times in the last hour. No, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I I just saw her on the credits as Mrs. Voorhees. So they must have given her Pamela after that. But. Either way, it, it ends up with her death in, after the events of the first one. And then even before the uh, Friday the 13th splash card happens, they do the second movie like immediately afterwards <laughs> where they have characters who tell the story that you've seen just seen in the opening title sequence but then they sort of spread it out a bit longer and then you're thinking that these are the kids that you're going to be following through the movie but then they get whacked and then the title card goes up and then you find out there's a whole new group of kids in particular the brother to one of the girls of the first group and where the real connection to the movies the original movies comes in is the pendant, which somebody made the off comment, hey, you look like this woman, you should keep it. In the second movie of the original series, uh, the reason why she was kept around was because Jason does mistake her for her mom, and she plays into that. And they don't quite necessarily go with that as a good explanation as to why she was kept around for a good couple months alive in this basement, to which she's reacting very poorly, I might add. Like, any time she hears something, freaks out and starts screaming... Anytime it gets close, stops. Are you trying to get someone's attention? Or are you trying to hide from Jason as though he doesn't know he chained you up on a bed under the floor? Which is it? (laughs) There were a lot of references. There was the scene where Jason turns on the lights, which is similar to when Mrs. Voorhees turns on the lights at the archery, uh, the archery range. There's the scene where Jason shoots the bow into the guy's head while he's driving the boat. The scene where he's jabbing the knife up through the floor in the cabin. 
which he's very good at fixing, so it looks like nothing ever happened, I might add. Perhaps that's another one of his powers. It's like the Chaos Castle from Castlevania. I'm just referencing everything now. I think when he <laughs> throws the axe into the back of that one character, I think that was sort of reminiscent of when he puts the hatchet, or when Mrs. Voorhees puts the hatchet into the face of the second or third victim from the first movie. I thought that would be more so the kill at the beginning where he's running up behind the girl and machete to the guy's face while she's trying to help him out of the bear trap. Mm, that's possible too. Also, the uh, hanging sleeping bag was also a kill from the second one, so a lot of that is very reminiscent of the second movie. There were a lot of situations, there were a lot of a lot of callbacks, and I think fans appreciated that. I, I kinda, know I did. <laughs> I kind of liked it, but in a weird way, as much as I liked it, I think that also helped cement that whole idea that this was this weird, fabricated reality within, like, the Friday the 13th universe or something, where Jason weirdly... If Jason drowned in the original film in 1957, Jason drowns, because counselors are having sex. In 1958, Mrs. Voorhees comes and kills two counselors to punish them. Because they were having sex. Because they were about to have sex. 20 years later, the kids go to the camp and they start getting picked off by Mrs. Voorhees because she's like, oh no, you're not going to open this camp. In the remake, in the 2009 version, all of that theoretically still happens. But if Jason was dead a year previous to her killing camp counselors after she gets her head chopped off jason comes crawling out of the bushes and they're like he witnessed his mother being beheaded where was this where's this kid been and if if he was still alive why would she be getting revenge on the other characters on the other counselors why did jason just not go home like he li- that's his neighborhood <laughs> that's like me accidentally falling out of my car while driving past the Safeway down the road and being like, fuck, I don't know what to do now. And finally walking down the street like a year later to see my mom get killed. Like, what kind of timing is this? (laughs) That's ridiculous. And then wrapping your head in a bag. And of course, nobody finds him. Nobody finds him. I guess nobody bothered to check the house where this person who died lived. They know it was Pamela Voorhees who did the killings. Let's not bother to check her house where her head is just in a hole in the wall over here and her kid is apparently living in a series of tunnels underneath. Nobody bothers with this? I think the narrative flow of the remake... And at the same time, sorry, uh, one of the neighbors knows Jason lives there. He says, she says specifically, we just want to be left alone and so does he. What? Who? Closed the door on your face? Fuck off, buddy. (laughs) (laughs) The narrative flow of the 2009 version is far better than the narrative flow of the 1980 version. But that whole internal lack, complete lack of internal logic is still there. Because the reason why Jason is killing doesn't entirely make sense. Who he chooses to kill, when and how he chooses to kill, why people are going there or not going there. I mean... Presumably people know that he's there because of the person who mentions it. Why does he kill the guy driving the boat from across the lake? It makes no sense. Unless he somehow knew he was part of that one group and just anybody who goes to visit. Thing is, this guy, that's his dad's cabin that he was visiting. Why kill them now? Presumably he's gone to this cabin throughout his life. He's essentially a resident of the lake. Just across the lake from Camp Crystal Lake. And doesn't care up until that point. (laughs) Yet now somehow he's killing him. There's the other guy who's just like working in a wood chipper. He lives there. He works there. And all of a sudden Jason decides... Today's the day I'm going to kill this guy. Just entirely out of the blue. Hell, he found the the stash of weed that was growing that the first group of campers was looking for and got killed for. So somebody came there, planted it all. Nothing happened to them. These group, This group comes here, killed immediately. Then somebody else goes, finds it. No problem. It's entirely arbitrary who he's killing. <laughs> it's been years since I've seen any of the sequels. And I know that... The first, like, eight movies are supposed to be one kind of continuous story. And I remember enjoying a lot of these movies when I was younger, but I just have this feeling that, unlike other films of this ilk, other slasher films, like the Michael Myers movies, like the Freddy movies, I I just, I think the lack of any sort of logic might just be... The logic, Part of the DNA of these movies. The logic actually works a lot more in the original series because... 
the first four movies happen very quickly in succession. Like he escapes from this, he escapes from the ambulance where he's being taken away and goes on to start killing almost immediately. There's very, there's far fewer jumps in logic into when he's killing and how he's killing, especially when he's dead between one movie and they show his resurrection. All right, that's why he wasn't killing in the interim period. That makes perfect sense. I can understand that. But here, because they're trying to cram in the four movies without having him killed in between, it it's going to not make sense, especially since nobody's bothered to go out and look for this guy and actually try to kill him. Unless it turns out in the sequel that they did try, didn't work, and they're like, you know what, screw this, we're just going to walk away. I hear rumors that they're going to explain his immortality, which they're going to have to since he was impaled and then came back immediately at the very end, which made no sense once more. He wasn't impaled. He went through a thresher or a wood chipper. Well, they they wrapped the chain around his neck, which was strangling him for a good long while. And then the uh, one female survivor who he kidnapped, the sister, says, Hey, Jason, say hi to mommy or some shit like that. Stabs him right through the chest with true. a machete. Okay, that's and true. And then he's just being strangled and he's completely immobile. They bring him out to the dock, kick him over, throw the mask into the lake. He comes out with the mask on and just drags her back in. Which, which is a is... callback to the original film. Exactly. Callback to that not making any sense. So apparently he decided this mask, which I <laughs> something found Something that makes no sense is a callback to something that makes no sense. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Presumably he thought, you know what? I've gone the last 20, 30 years without this mask, but now I just have to have it. So he goes down, he grabs it, and he jumps straight up through the wood at the dock, which is an impressive feat, quite frankly. And unnecessary, since there was water all around them, he could have gone through. Nope. Straight up through the wood. <laughs> now, which version did you watch? Because I'm led to believe that there is, like, an unrated cut that is out there that's a little bit longer. If ever possible, I always look for the unrated cut. I'm pretty sure that I watched the theatrical cut. I think I made a point of wanting to watch the theatrical cut because when we're dealing with uh, the masterpiece movies, we're generally looking at whatever hit theaters not like the director's cuts or the extended cuts. You gotta see what initially made it popular, what initially the audiences saw. But I was curious just because I'm pretty sure I saw the theatrical cut. If you had seen the extended cut, if you had seen something that maybe made more sense, or if maybe it was just a bloodier movie. And the thing is, you'd have to see both to really tell. Normally, if it's a couple minutes here and there, it doesn't make that big of a difference. I think. It would have to be a really poignant scene. <laughs> And somehow I don't see Friday the 13th having that one scene that just cements the whole thing together. Oddly enough, I kind of feel like, even though Jason has a very simple, clean-cut reason to be doing what he's doing, out of all the horror movies that I can think of, particularly like long-lasting franchises, I feel like Jason's motivations are the weakest and the, and the least tangible. He arbitrarily hears his mom saying, kill them, baby, kill them. Despite the fact that she's never said that to him, ever. We don't know if he's actually just deformed or also mentally handicapped. So would he understand the concept of camp counselors versus any random civilian? He's just crazy guy who lives out in the woods and kills essentially... He goes on a killing spree at random. I like to think, once again, like Castlevania, he's Vlad Tepe's coming back every 50 years to do one thing and then dis disappears into the ether which is how his cabin keeps moving and is not searched by the police. Having played Castlevania like once when I was 14, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Understandably so. I've played a lot of the games. I've read the history. The whole thing makes no sense. Rest assured. <laughs> Although, to be fair, it is another horror franchise. <laughs> and I think there was a remake for the next generation consoles. It's, but that's it's another not story. A They're all sequels and prequels. That's another thing. That's another thing. So... I did find it interesting, though, that in order to make sure that Jason was the killer here, that they remade four movies into one, essentially. And I thought, as a concept, that's actually quite interesting. Whether or not it worked is up for discussion, which is kind of why we're here. But as a concept, it's interesting. And honestly, I think I rate the movie higher knowing that that's what they did and being able to see that. I, I feel that they needed stronger writers, though. I think to accomplish what they really wanted to do if you just basically want to make a splatter film, then it doesn't really matter who's writing it. As long as you've got your your bloody gags and your set pieces, you're good to go. But I think if they really wanted to make, you know, something really interesting, say what you want about Rob Zombie's Halloween, but 
he he really like sunk his teeth into the material. Hundred percent. He tried to make something new and something interesting that was also very true to the original material, and he recognized the weaknesses of the original material. And whether you think he succeeded at that or not is is not the discussion here. But I feel like what they've done with Friday the Thirteenth is kind of a greatest hits. I don't think they were really trying to manufacture something really lasting. I think I think it was quite literally just a cash grab. Let's let's see if we can get these movies out again and and make some more money. And you know what? There's nothing 100% terrible with here's a dumb cheesy movie. When when they release Friday the 13th the remake, you're not thinking I'm going to go this and I'm going to expect my worldview to change. No, you're going there to see some blood, guts and tits. That's that's what you're expecting and they did that. You don't necessarily expect a whole lot of really good writing, but it's always nice to have, you know? <laughs> I think for me, bottom line is if, I, if I'm going to go with a big, lumbering, masked, knife-wielding, immortal maniac, I'm probably going to go with Michael Myers before I side with Jason. I just feel I don't really have like a, a connection to Jason the way that some people do. I think the iconography and the imagery is interesting, but I just couldn't give a rat's ass. I prefer the creepiness factor of Jason to Mike Myers. You think Jason's creepy? Well, just the whole uh, deformed, like, grubby clothing as opposed to, like, a janitor's onesie sort of deal that Mike Myers always seems to be wearing. Plus, it's out in the woods, which to me tends to be a lot creepier than in your own home. When you're in your own home, I feel there's always that sense of safety when you're in a more familiar environment. When you're out at a camp, like... There's no cell reception. There's no police station to go to. There's no neighbors to go find. No, you're stuck out in the middle of the woods. And being stuck out in the middle of the woods can itself be its own survival movie. Here you've stuck out in this middle of the woods and you've got some crazy guy coming at you that apparently is immortal. Especially if you watch uh, Friday the 13th Nine, Jason Goes to Hell. What do you do? <laughs> you know, you kind of brought up an interesting point unintentionally. I think this movie might have been stronger for me had they maintained sort of a running camp. I realize that, you know, kids going to camp is not necessarily... I mean, they still exist. I've sent my kids to summer camp. Like, people still go to summer camps. I've gone to summer camps. (laughs) This is a real thing. Well, no, I mean, like, like now. But when they remade Evil Dead, they were saying, oh, you know, we needed to give them something to go there and do like kids don't just drive off into the middle of nowhere and hang out in a cabin. Why not? (laughs) So they made it an intervention. And I know some people have issue with that, but I had no problem with it. I think it works in the sense that she thought she was hearing things and everyone attributed it to the drugs, which helped with the slower ramp up style. Normally when it's like, here's a bunch of spooky stuff happening and everyone's like, Oh no, no, let's just ignore it. It drives me a little nuts. But for them to be able to say, no, it's because she's on drugs and she killed the dog and she's smelling the stuff that didn't happen and hearing things and seeing things. You can still have things happen to the one person, but nobody believes her. And I think that actually worked in their favor. I think trying to avoid the whole summer camp thing hurt this movie. Well, they're always trying to avoid kids being killed. It's got to be 20 sums. (laughs) You think that's the reason? Yeah, I think they they wouldn't want to have a bunch of little kids being killed or finding the dead bodies or anything like that. I think that's the big reason but it why would they be, kept that stuff closed. It's the counselors at the camp before the camp opens. So the kids haven't arrived yet. Yeah, in the first one. And that, that'll work for one or two. And actually, there's a lot of movies where that's the exact same thing that happens. The camp opens up many a time over the franchise's history. And Jason keeps coming back. And killing them off, because apparently nobody seems to care. (laughs) Okay, just right now, in the middle of this conversation, I think I've rewritten this reboot in a way that I think would have worked better. (laughs) Which is unfortunate. But you have this whole camp that's actually a pretty nice camp. It seems weird to abandon the whole thing over one death, one accidental drowning, and then a series of murders from one person who everyone knows is gone. Well, beyond that, where on this planet, or or sorry, where in the U.S. or Canada are you going to find lakefront property that's not being used that is not going to be developed? (laughs) (laughs) 
No one would just leave a camp there. It just, it makes no sense. You've got all these houses around it, apparently really fancy houses owned by rich people, and a couple random locals. Nobody's just been like, well, the camp's shut down for the last 20, 30 years. Let's tear it down. Hell, that could be your next... That Friday could have the been the idea. Some developer comes in and wants to do something with the land, and Jason's been living there, and... And Jason's like, fuck that noise. I'm going to take this up with my political representative. <laughs> <laughs> and it gets bogged down in bureaucracy, and if that shit isn't scary, I don't know what is. Jason goes to Washington. <laughs> and then they mistreat him because he's deformed and hasn't spoken to anyone in 30 years, so he doesn't know how to deal with people, and it's the plight of all sorts of minorities going on right there. That is scary. That's true. It's real. That doesn't tear at your soul. I mean, he was just stabbed and nearly drowned and almost choked. You think there he's going to get Medicare? I don't think so. He's not going to go down to the hospital. They're going to say, so who's your HMO? <laughs> he hasn't paid taxes in 30 years. He's got troubles. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's a cannibal. I'm pretty sure he was eating things that he was bringing home. I'm pretty sure he wasn't cleaning up after himself. That's for damn sure. <laughs> this kid's living in arrested development as far as I'm concerned. He's like, I like the basement. The basement's cool. He digs that out. That's what he's been doing the last 30 years. He's a freaking mole now. <laughs> Somebody calls social services. <laughs> All right, well, I'm, I'm not sure we really have anything else to add to this discussion, so we're going to kind of wrap it up here. We'll start with Dustin. Final thoughts on 1980, Friday the 13th, 2009, Friday the 13th. I think that the original one is not really a classic worth visiting unless you intend on visiting the whole series and looking at it sort of from an educational perspective, just a filmmaking perspective. Because I do think that for the most part, horror movies especially are a product of their time and you can see sort of them constantly trying to push that boundary of essentially exploitation. People like to see blood and guts. They like to see TNA. And slashers are sort of that thing that pushes that envelope. Nowadays, we get something that's got all the more violence, all the more sex, just like the remake. And we've got like the French extremism movement where you've got all sorts of stuff that's so far beyond. And it's constantly just pushing that envelope. So it's interesting to think of what'll what kind of horrible stuff we'll be seeing in 30 years, quite frankly. So if anything, it's a museum piece, just something to look at, but it's it's certainly no masterpiece. <laughs> well, no, we're not judging whether it's a museum piece or masterpiece. It's just... No, we're not judging it on those standards, you, but I'm going to judge everything think... on those standards regardless. Okay. <laughs> I don't think if you're looking for a scary movie, the original movie is something to go to. I do not think that. If you're looking for a cheap slasher... The 2009 remake, there's your cheap slasher. That's about all you can expect from it. I found them both to be quite marginal. I'm actually glad that we started our first week with these two movies because I have a feeling that as we go on, we're going to be hitting more movies that I know for a fact that I like and we'll be able to talk, you know, more strengths than weaknesses. Uh, these movies actually surprised me with how little I liked them. I think I'm honestly surprised that, that there is... 10 sequels, the original, and a remake. I'm curious, actually, to revisit some of the sequels, just because, like I said before, I remember enjoying them more as a kid, or, or as a younger person. I enjoy the whole thing more as a franchise. As individual movies, yeah, they are lackluster. <laughs> but, yeah, like, if, if somebody was like, hey, what do you think we should watch on a scary movie night, or on Halloween, or... These would not be movies that I would go to. I think I'm probably more in line with what you said, if you want just you know, a slasher movie with a bit of a budget. You can watch the 2009 version. It's very watchable as far as horror movies go. But I'm probably not going to revisit either of these movies anytime soon. It's probably been 20 years or more since I've seen the original, and if I go another 20 years, I think I'm okay. <laughs> Sounds pretty fair. <laughs> so I hope that wasn't too depressing. <laughs> and that you'll join us next week when we'll be tackling another horror classic, and it's most likely not classic remake. If we're going to be slowly upping the ante like a classic horror film usually does, the next one will probably be Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I guess that's been decided since it has officially been recorded. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way to cut or edit any of this, so... <laughs> So 
So we'd be interested to hear your thoughts on uh, the Friday the 13th movies. Let us know what you think of what we've said in the discussion, and we're curious... As to what you think a classic horror franchise is. <laughs> what are the qualities, and which one would you like us to visit, if possible? Maybe not this year, but next. You can let us know on our Facebook page, or on Twitter, where we are at FYC Show. We're on Instagram, we're on Stitcher, we're on iHeartRadio, we're all over the internet. Check us out, tell your friends. Tell your enemies. Tell your acquaintances. Don't tell Larry. That kid's creepy. We don't want anything to do with him. That's a wrap on this episode of For Your Consideration. We hope to see you next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Until then, I'm Dustin. And I'm Mike. Take care. Peace. Cheers. Salud. Ta-ta. Slante. I won't.